Christian, and I'm here to introduce you to this afternoon's author, Peter Sweden. Uh, but before I begin my introduction, I just want to tell you a little bit more about our VC author series. Uh, this series encourages dialogue on significant contemporary questions and brings together alumni, faculty, staff, and students to, and members of our community to debate and discuss these issues. Uh, this fall semester, we have a number of events planned with, which cover a wide range of topics, including marketing, law, women's studies, music, and feature authors like Lou Imbriano, the previous CMO for the New England Patriots, and Linda Cohn, the first full-time woman sportscaster at ESPN. If you haven't already, I encourage you to pick up the full list of programs that are out on the uh, sign-in table in the front. And I also ask that you take the time to fill out a comment card at the end of this program so we can collect your feedback and hear how we can improve our programs in the future. You can return the card to a library staff volunteer at the end. Uh, to help us continue to provide programs like today's talk, I ask that you consider becoming a library supporter today. More information about supporting the library and about the university's Frank Palmer Peer Society can be found at our sign-in table as well. We're also filming today's event, which will be available on Northeastern University Library's YouTube channel and iTunes University channel. For more information about the library, our services, and upcoming programs, we, please like us on Facebook at Northeastern University Library or follow us on Twitter at Club Smart. Today's VC Author program featuring Peter Sweden is made possible by our co-sponsors, the Northeastern Political Science Department, and the Northeastern History Department, as well as the Northeastern University Book Fair. I would also like to thank the Libraries Programming and Communications Committee for their work in pulling this event together, and especially Freddie Fowler, Marcin Lewandowski, and Eve Strout, for, who worked really hard on all the coordination for this program. Peter Sweden is the news and features editor of the Boston Irish Reporter and the award-winning author of several books, including The Voyage of the Catalpa, A Perilous Journey, and Six Irish Lovers to Safety Sweden. He is a frequent contributor to a wide array, array of magazines, including American Heritage, American History, Early American Life, and Women. Additionally, the New York Times has syndicated Stephen's articles to newspapers nationwide, and he is a two-time winner of the International Regional Magazine Association's Gold Medal for Crusaders. Stevens is here with us today to talk about his book, The Twilight Riders, The Last Charge of the 26th Cavalry, in which he perfectly recaps the trials the 26th Cavalry endured before, during, and after the Japanese invasion. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Peter Stevens. Okay, thank you very much, Nina. It should be all set. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, first of all, I'd like to want to thank everybody for taking time out from what I know, because I remember a long time ago in college, a very busy schedule, so I do appreciate your coming out for this. Um, the Twilight Riders, as Nina said, is um, about a really unique moment in the annals of American history, but also world history, because um, it really marks the passing of an era. It was the last time in modern warfare that men fought on horseback in a coordinated effort, fought on a whole campaign on horseback. And they did so against tanks, aircraft, you name it. They took on everything. So just as an overview, I mean, the it was shortly after Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese invasion of the Philippines was underway. Among the Philippine defenders was a group of Filipino non-commissioned officers and enlisted men, led by all-white American officers, many from West Point. They were from a different era, all of them, trained to fight on horseback, as had the cavalry of the Civil War and other conflicts in American history. They battled fiercely against their Japanese foes, but in the end were forced to slaughter their horses and to finish their hopeless fight on foot. But they didn't finish that fight before they did a number of things. One of the most important things they did was to buy time in the dark days early days of World War II after Pearl Harbor, was to buy time for the Americans and the Filipinos to mount a defense and to delay the Japanese advance, throwing them off their timetable, which had disastrous 
application for the Japanese nuclear war went on. But when I first started to um, research this book, it was my intent to kind of cover that and present it in a vivid, as vivid and colorful a way as I could as to what the 26th Cavalry was, what they meant, and how they were the last of their kind. But as I began to talk to people, there aren't that many survivors left of the unit. And one of the things, um, there was a treasure trove of material from several of the American officers. These were, were all young men at the time, and they had incredible experiences there in the Philippines. And their memories of both the campaign and the Filipinos that they fought with have absolutely colored and shaped their lives ever since the survival. And it's important to note, before the war began, the 26th, it was a small unit. It was about 750 men and officers. And before the war began, they were one of the best trained units in the American Army. Um, we were taught so unprepared for war by the Japanese on December 1941 that there were only a handful of our units that were anywhere up to par and ready to fight. And the 26th was one. And there were a number of reasons for this. They had a very colorful commander, a man named Clint Pierce. And Clint Pierce was really a throwback. He had begun his career in the U.S. Army just as mechanized, just as tanks and trucks and aircraft were changing the face of modern warfare. But he was a throwback, trained as a cavalry officer. He had escaped Camp Revere um, across the Texas-Mexican border. And um, he cut his military teeth, so to speak, on the Western Front in World War II. And Pierce was every inch the fighting man, and he was the perfect officer for this unit because he was all about spit and polish. But on the other hand, he had a love for horses, too, that was um, almost as fierce as his love for his own men. And one of the things I came to realize as I talked to um, a number of the survivors, and in particular, one man, a Filipino named Felipe Fernandez. And in many respects, it wasn't what I had set out to do, but this book, The Twilight Riders, became, in a sense, his story. Because Felipe gave something different to me and also to his story that hadn't been there before. Some of the officers had actually published their memoirs. And again, very vivid, really colorful. But the one thing that was missing from them were the recollections of the men they commanded, the Filipinos. And when I spoke to um, Felipe, a number of times over the years, and we spent hours on the phone. And once we came to know and trust each other a bit, Felipe really began to open up. He had bottled up all these memories he had of his experiences in the Philippines and with the 26th. And in particular, what began to become evident was the affinity and actually the love that he had for this horse. And the horse's name was Mike. And as the book went on, Mike actually became one of the central characters. And the relationship between Felipe and um, Mike absolutely stands as kind of the, um, the perfect foundation for every single one of these men who fought on horseback against the Japanese. And with Felipe and Mike, it, um, Felipe said to me, and when he first said it to me, I was kind of taken aback, but I was um, – just, I didn't quite understand when he said that the two most important relationships he had in his life with his wife, Amelia, and his horse, Mike. And he said Mike, to him, was more as much was his best friend other than his wife. He had never had a better friend than Mike. And he began to talk about his experiences um, with Mike during the war, how he had trained him for the war, and all the rest of it. He be I began, for the first time, to maybe understand a little bit the age-old bond that men have had with their horses in common since the earliest days of civilization when, when um, unfortunately, warfare had been with us since the beginning. And um, as soon as men figured out that the horse was a weapon that would um, give them an incredible advantage in battle, it wasn't just about – it's not the same thing now as a man hopping into a tank, hopping into a motorcycle, a jeep, whatever it is. There was a literal flesh and blood bond between rider and horse. And as I got deeper into the book, even though, yes, it was about the 26th, the, their incredible performance and the battles they fought and all, more and more I began to draw upon from some of the officers and from Felipe in particular, who rose to sergeant and wasn't an officer. Um, there were no Filipino officers in the 26th. Um, Felipe 
might became almost inseparable, one, one and the same. The same with several of the officers in the book who would constantly refer to their forces in a way that, again, their comrades, their comrades in arms with their horses. And to me, that became the most amazing thing about this story. Now, I'm just going to um, run a few photos here, give you a look at what, this was the 26th, um, a few years before the war. They're drawn up on the parade ground as of their base in the Philippines. And you can see, it's not the whole unit, but you can see they were a combination of units. Um, you see the vehicles there are scout vehicles. And they were some of the Philippine scouts, as they were called, were trained to fight and move. They were equipped with machine guns, and they were very fast, very mobile. The trucks you see in the back are not the transporting men. Those are the veterans' trucks there. The horses were literally the light body of the team. And so those were the veterans' trucks that deployed them. And you see them drawn up in their formation, you see that, that's Troop A, Troop B, there were five troops in the, in the uh, unit. But um, you can get a sense from that picture just kind of the spit and polish. I mean, it's, a, it's hard to say that you can get an emotion from a photo, but you can almost see the pride in the perfectly formed ranks there. And you see a unit that looks like it's ready for anything. And they had to be, they were, and what they did in the coming warfare against the Japanese is it defies logic and it's one of the most incredible stories in American military history. So that's the 26 there. I just before I start talking about some of the people, that right there is an artist model of what the 26 riders look like going into combat. You can see um, the equipment that they had. It was basically all World War One built. You see the old doughboy helmet. You see the um, they have their riding boots there and, and for their weapons. They no longer carried the classic ca cavalry weapons that they had had. They didn't do that anymore because things had moved too fast. They were, n they were not going to be charging tanks. Mass stands were going to do that kind of thing, although in the end they did. Um, so that right there is um, what one of the Filipino enlisted men would have looked like on his horse. Um, and interesting, too, is the fact that each of the troops, whether it be Troop A, Troop B, Troop C, they were all distinguished by the type of horse that they had. The color horses, some of them uh, units had only bay, some of them only had mares, but they were distinguished, each unit, by the horse that they had. And there was a reason for that, because when they were in combat and you were trying to get back to your unit, if you'd been cut off or anything like that, if you saw the black horses, the golden colored horses, whatever the hue was, you knew that was your unit and you could try to work your way back to that. Um, that right there is just the, um, the shoulder strap, the ins shoulder insignia, each of the um, officers wore. That was their campaign motto. And as you can see, that was their motto, our strength is in our loyalty. And one thing that going into the war, a lot of the American officers, particularly with the infantry units, they were a little bit concerned that the Filipino units were, in fact, going to go all the way for them, were going to fight um, in the way that they felt that they should because before the war, there was great tension simmering in the Philippines. There was a very strong independence movement. There had been several uprisings by rebels in the Philippines trying to um, boot out the Americans, just trying to boot out foreigners in general. So as the, Japan as the war approached, there was a lot of tension in the ranks. And that was also in the 26th. Felipe Fernandez talked about that, that they obeyed their orders. They were proud of their units, they were proud of their horses, and just proud of the fact that the 26th was considered the best unit that Douglas MacArthur had in the Philippines. But there was also, among their officers, this wondering when the bullets started flying in December of 1941 when the Japanese invaded the Philippines, were the Philippines going to, Filipinos going to stand and fight, or were they going to melt away and maybe try to carry the fight up into the mountains in guerrilla warfare, or would they stand and fight the Japanese? They did. They stood and fight, and stood and fought, and then some. But you can see in the um, the uh, campaign ribbon how prominently you don't see a man; you see a horse. And this again gets to the fact they saw themselves as different from any other unit in the army. They saw themselves as the descendants of a long line of a military tradition, not only in American history but that spanned way back through the ages. Now, this right here. For me, especially when I began to talk to some of the survivors, kind of a haunting image. This is in the war's opening week, 
the Japanese in December 1941 had invaded the main island of the Philippines, Luzon, with the intention to drive to Manila, cut off MacArthur's troops, and force him to surrender. Here you can see literally the collision of two eras, the, the onset of one, the end of another. And one of the officers I spoke to, a guy named Ed Ramsey, still with us, thank God, and he's, um, he led the last cavalry charge in American history, in history, period, and we'll talk about him in a moment. But you can see that is a Jeb Stuart, a light American tank, and it's not the tanks that are going to the front. This is several miles from the beaches where the Japanese have landed. It's the 26 riding to the front because the plan was to get the 26 in there, hide the horses behind the dunes, behind the beachhead, set up positions to take on the Japanese and slow them down, and then devise hit and run tactics all the rest of the way through the campaign. But literally, it's for me, and maybe the product of a vivid imagination, but you can almost see, this is where the image for the Twilight Riders came to me, because one of the officers I spoke to has said, every time he looks at that picture, it brings back memories to him, and he felt, felt as though, as they were passing tanks and the airplanes are whizzing overhead, that they were riding into history's twilight, that they still had a job to do. And they would do it with incredible bravery and incredible skill. This right here was one of the um, heroes of the 26th, an American-born officer. Um, John G. Wheeler was his name. That's Troop E, his command behind him. Felipe Fernandez is at the rear of the throne. He's not in this photo. But Wheeler, this was indicative of what they did. You can see they rode through the swamp. They rode through the jungle. What they did was bedeviled the Japanese, hit and run tactics all the way through to slow them down off the beachhead. They would hide their horses. Anytime airplanes would come overhead, they would go into the high grass. They would get them into the uh, jungle, whatever it was to protect the horses. But as you can imagine, many times they got caught out in the open, and the carnage was terrible. The unit was absolutely decimated by the end of the campaign. Wheeler wouldn't make it. Wheeler would be, um, Wheeler would not make, he would uh, be in the uh, Bataan Death March, but he didn't survive the chance. He was killed by a Japanese officer in one of the camps. I have a picture of him that was in Life magazine. But this right here on the left is Clint Pierce. Clint Pierce was the commander of the 26th, and I had talked about him before being a throwback, being someone who, in a sense, he should have been born in the 19th century. He was a man who was made to serve in the cavalry in the days of the Old West or the Civil War, even the Spanish-American War. But Pierce was a throwback. His men were just, literally would have followed him into hell. Everywhere the fighting was fiercest, everything they endured, Pierce was with them every step of the way to the point where finally towards the end of the campaign, the command, MacArthur's commander on the ground, General Jonathan Wainwright, an old friend of Pierce's, they were so concerned that Pierce was going to get himself killed by literally going wherever the bullets were going. Um, they eventually pulled him out because they felt he was too valuable an officer. And in the last weeks of the campaign, one of his other officers took over. The this right here is Pierce interrogating Japanese prisoners in the early days of the war. Now, you have to understand, in the opening weeks of the war, it was all bad. The Japanese were just pushing back the Americans, the British, the Dutch, everyone in Southeast Asia. And it was no different in the Philippines. MacArthur's plan was called War Plan Orange, and it was to delay the, fall back to a series of lines and delay the Japanese every step of the way so that the American and Filipino army could set up a defense on Bataan and Corregidor. Now, we all know about the Bataan Death March, and it doesn't sound like they bought much, but they did by delaying the Japanese advance, throwing them off their timetable, and also enacting a huge toll upon the Japanese in which the 26th Infantry, I'm sorry, the 26th Cavalry was more feared by the Japanese than any of the other units that they were facing on their drive towards Manila. On the left there is General Jonathan, nicknamed Skinny Wings, and he was an old cavalry officer too. The 26th Cavalry was his pet unit. He was the man who commanded the American Filipino forces battling first on the beachhead and then falling back to buy time for the rest of MacArthur's army to get to Bataan. That's MacArthur with him there. Now, interesting thing, when you talk to the survivors of the 26th, you mention Wainwright's name, Pierce, some of these guys, and 
it's almost worship, this complete reverence for him. Wainwright was with him every step of the way. Wainwright was a survivor of the Bataan Death March, and they were just fiercely devoted to him. Wainwright also was driving MacArthur and the other officers crazy because wherever the 26th was fighting, the old cavalryman, Wainwright, wanted to be with him. And several times, he almost lost his life on the, on the front lines with the 26th. This is a shot here in late December of 1941 when it was all falling apart and the Japanese were um, falling on Manila and the 26th was still fighting a delaying action in the north, holding the bridges so that the bulk of the army could fall back. And it's important to uh, note that whenever the retreat was going on full bore, it was the 26th that Wainwright was throwing to fight the Japanese, to hold them off, to buy time for the rest of the army to fall back. But what happened, the Manila declared themselves an open city to try to prevent from being bombed by the Japanese and all. Didn't work out that way. They still suffered a terrible toll. These are um, men of the uh, 26th training with an anti-tank weapon. Now, what's interesting about this photo is when the war erupted, a lot of the supplies to the Americans and Filipinos were destroyed in the first days of the war by the Japanese aircraft. They Japanese planes, they destroyed the Air Force, the um, U.S. Air Force in the Philippines basically, and a treasure trove of supplies. These anti-tank guns, which would have been unbelievably useful for the 26th when they were fighting the Japanese in the first few months of the war, uh, they didn't have them. They trained for nothing. These guns were all destroyed before they could get them to the front. So what they were left with was their horses and their ingenuity. And what they began to do was devise methods of attacking Japanese tanks to slow them down. They didn't charge them. What they would do, they would set up ambushes and they would assign a, a couple of men to take the horses to cover, crawl on their bellies to the road, to wherever it was the Japanese tanks were coming, and using improvised Molotov cocktails, using strings of grenades, whatever they could do. They would literally run up to the tanks, try to pry open the hatches, shove the grenades down into them, and get back off the side of the road. They took out a lot of Japanese tanks doing this. And uh, the Japanese were always so afraid that these guys did have anti-tank weapons that they would always hesitate before hitting the 26th. And Clint Pierce and his officers would set up positions to make it look like they had anti-tank guns, but they had none. So with this ruse that they used constantly throughout the first few months of the war, yet another way they were able to slow the Japanese down, but all the while taking a terrible toll. These here, um, our men of the 26th uh, Cavalry building a pontoon bridge to ford one of the many deep rivers, <coughs> excuse me, and streams in the uh, northern Philippines on the island of Luzon. What they would do was lay all the boards across it so they could get both themselves and their horses across. This was a Japanese commander um, in the Philippines. His name was Masaharu Hama. He very interesting man. He was a um, very accomplished man. He was a gifted writer. He was known to the Japanese as the poet general. He was in charge of the invasion of the Philippines and was on a very strict timetable. And the 26th threw his timetable completely off. And a lot of his strategy was devised, he and his generals trying to find ways to finally destroy the 26th, get them out of the way, and pick up the advance. It never worked out that way. He was executed um, in the war crimes trials after the war for the Bataan Death March and the atrocities committed on the Bataan Death March in the camp. In fairness to him, a lot of, um, it's not revisionist history, a lot of scholars have found that he never was, he was kind of detached from that. He didn't give the orders for the Bataan Death March to be that brutal or anything like that, but he was the man at the top and MacArthur made sure that he was in control at the end of the war. This gentleman here, his name was um, Major Thomas Trapp, was his nickname, Trapp Nell. Interesting guy. He graduated at the top of his class in West Point in 1926, and he's one of the best football players that West Point has ever produced. He was an All-American halfback at West Point, still holds some of the school's rushing records, but he was kind of um, a man of action. He wanted in in the cavalry, and uh, he was just absolutely one of the uh, finest officers in these opening days of the war and utterly fearless. And he was another one. His men, his Filipino soldiers, and his American officers alike 
pretty much worship this guy. They would follow him anywhere. And wherever they went, that's where he was too. These, the officers of the uh, 26, it's important to um, note that um, they were not giving orders to their men and sending them off and waiting to see what happened. They were with them every step of the way. These are Japanese tanks um, driving, down to driving towards Manila and all, but these were the type of tanks that the 26 was taking on almost every day during this, and they took a terrible toll. They destroyed a lot of them, and again, through the Japanese optic timetable. And it's not hyperbole to say if the 26 had not literally sacrificed their lives, their blood, their horses in the opening weeks of the war, the opening two months of the war, it's entirely possible that the defenses would have crumbled, the Japanese would have been in Manila, MacArthur would have been cut off, and MacArthur would never have been extricated, would never have um, been pulled out of the Philippines by FDR to literally fight another day. In fairness to MacArthur, a lot of people have used this as a blemish against him as if he wanted to desert his men. He wanted to leave his men. Not the case. He was ordered by FDR. He bucked it. He bucked it hard. But in the end, he had to obey his commander-in-chief. They felt he was way too valuable to allow the Japanese to get their hands on him. So his top aide, Jonathan Wainwright, Skinny Wainwright, was the one who was literally left holding the bag in the Philippines. And because he would suffer every step of the way, everything these his men did, the 26 and the uh, rest of the defenders of the Philippines, there's a lot of the men who, and it's perfectly understandable, absolutely revere Wainwright, and they loathe MacArthur to his dying day. They felt that he had bailed on them, although, again, he had to follow his orders. That right there is, he's breathing. That's a um, motorcycle messenger of the uh, 26, and these were the guys, they absolutely, um, along with the um, scouts on horseback, they were the only real means of communication the officers had in the field. The radios were constantly being shot up. Communications were poor. And officers relied on these guys and also scouts on horses to come up with orders at the front to try to um, find out where they needed to be, where the Japanese were going to be. And this guys like him and also some of the mounted scouts were the absolute lifeline for communication to the American Army in the um, early days of the war. Um, here, Japanese bicycle scouts. Time and time again, in sort of a strange collision of, um, it's not what you would call high technology, but you would have these battles between these guys on bikes and the 26 on horseback. So you'd have these weird mixes of bicycle versus mounted, mounted troops. And as you might imagine, the 26 generally got the best of these guys. But they met each other often on the way. These are two of the officers of the 26, kind of a ghostly image. One reason a lot of the photos that you see of from the officers, from men, they look so faded. This picture, for instance, they carried these photos with them the entire course of the war through the POW camps. Somehow, along with pictures of their wives, their mothers, their sweethearts, family, they kept pictures of themselves and their horses. And these are two of the officers. Uh, Blanning, um, Captain Blanning and Lieutenant Whitehead of the uh, 26 Cavalry. And uh, you can see, again, it's not a color photo, but you can tell these two horses were from the same troops. You can see roughly the same size. They were the same color. And again, this is how they were able to figure out where their comrades were in the melee. This is just an artist drawing of, um, on Christmas Day, the 20 of 1941, the 26 Cavalry at a village called Binalonan and also Rosario held the Japanese all that Christmas day. And if the Japanese had broken through, then half of Wainwright's army would have been cut off and it would have just been probably the end by New Year's. They would have been cut in half. But the 26 just took them on with everything they had, horses, machine guns, anything they could get their hands on. And they held the Japanese to the point you can see, and this was literally what was happening, Japanese tanks would be coming down the road, and the men of the 26, they'd be keeping up fire as hot and heavy as they could, and they would have guys crawling up to the tanks and putting satchel grenades, 
makeshift bombs, whatever they could to slow them down and set them on fire. And time and time again it worked. But they literally saved, this was um, one of the um, half track armored vehicles that the 26th would use. These were mainly useful for them to try to cover the horses when they were caught on the open road by Japanese aircraft. <coughs> the scout cars, once again, and then that's MacArthur inspecting the 26th shortly before the war. That was the gates to the parade ground where the 26th was to go. This is late in the campaign, and you can see how ragged they look, how tired they look. But what you can also see is how much fight was still left in these guys. They wanted to fight to the end, and they were fighting for their homes. This is an artist's rendition of the last cavalry charge in U.S. history. And um, I'm going to uh, just read an excerpt from the book to, to just... Um, give some idea of what this was like. It was led by a young officer named Ed Ramsey, who prior to the war breaking out, his chief interests were playing polo. The 26th had a polo team, which they would play against um, a very good team in Manila. And um, he was a member of that with polo, drinking in Manila, gambling in Manila, and hitting all the brothels he could find in Manila. That was his pre-war experience, and he loved it. What he found, though, was um, once the war began, he became one of the finest, completely untested, but was one of those men who absolutely rose to the occasion, found it in him leadership ability and not fearlessness. He will always say he was scared you know what every step of the way but he found that he was always able to keep his head always able to function and the last cavalry charge in u.s history happened on january 16th 1942 and it was in action it wasn't one of these deals where at the end of a field the officers formed up the cavalry in a long line in ranks and this majestic charge like the charge of the light brigade down into the valley and all that it wasn't like that what this was was an accidental meeting between the column Ramsey was leading and thousands of Japanese infantry pouring into a village around a bend, and he literally rode right up to them, and it was just a reflexive reaction to charge, and that's what he did. So this is basically in Ramsey's words. Um, Ramsey signaled, this is on January 16th, 1942, and again, things were really bad, really grim at this point. They were losing the war, and they knew it, but they were still fighting. Young Ed Ramsey signaled his men to saddle up and led them out of the camp. Huge ruts forced the men and horses to pick their way carefully toward the village of Morong. The road state would hamper the progress of them every step of the way. Eyeing the knotted waist-high brush on both sides of the route, the 26 riders could not see more than a foot or two into it, the threat of ambush looming anywhere behind the dense undergrowth. To give any concealed Japanese snipers a less effective field of fire, Ramsey spread out his riders in two staggered columns and posted four of his scouts 30 yards ahead of the column. The platoons picked their way along the trail for about four miles. Then Ramsey raised his hand to halt the column when he saw his advance guard rein up. He nudged his horse, Bryn Orange, up to them and glimpsed the eastern outskirts of Morong just ahead. A trio of narrow trails led from the main track, the middle one leading into the town the sea glistening in the distance behind all three. Peering down each track with his scarred black binoculars, Ramsey noted that all three trails were clear, no sign of Japanese tanks or infantry anywhere. Raising his left arm and gesturing at the middle trail, Ramsey formed his men into a column and raised his pistol above his head so that those behind him could see it. They instantly reached into their hip holsters and slid out their own 45 caliber pistols. Each man wore a lanyard stretching from the left shoulder to the right hip and attached to the pistol butt to prevent the weapon's loss if it was dropped while on horseback. Long gone was the traditional saber of the U.S. cavalry trooper, the famed blade phased out in the 1930s. Ramsey edged his men toward the town center with a soul stone, soul stone structure, a Catholic church, jutted above the packed earth of the road. Halting his troopers, he scanned the terrain ahead, Dense stands of coconut palms bordered a rancid swamp that stretched to the sea. 
there was no sign of Japanese troops amid the trees. To the right of the palms in the swamp stretched the narrow Battle on River, the defensive line General Wainwright had deemed so crucial and had ordered Ramsey to secure. A ramshackle wooden bridge spanned the river. Ramsey's advance riders disappeared past the church, and the rest trailed after them, the horses maneuvering head high among the woven huts, the men alert for any movement. Suddenly, a blinding flash lit the, lit the town square. An explosion rocked the trail, and several of the horses reared up on their riders. As troopers battled to rein in their mounts, sheets of rifle and automatic weapons fire erupted from the northern edge of the town. Birds' screeches added to the din as the brilliantly plumed creatures poured out of the jungle and darted away. The advance riders galloped back into sight past the church and dashed through the heavy fire to rejoin their comrades. One of the scouts had been hit, and blood was coursing down his ribs and spattering his horse's neck and haunches. A large Japanese vanguard had forded the river and was pouring past the church. Ed Ramsey later said, Now I could see scores of Japanese infantry in their brown fatigues firing from the village center, and behind them hundreds more wading in the river and crowding toward the bridge. In a few minutes more, the main body would be flooding across to seize the town. Ramsey made an instant and instinctive decision. Raising his pistol again, he shouted the age-old order, charge. He and his men bent nearly flat on their horses' backs and hurled, them hurled themselves forward through the sheets of Japanese fire. To them, Ramsey said, we must have seemed a vision from another century, wild-eyed horses pounding headlong, cheering, whooping men firing from saddles. The final charge of the U.S. cavalry unfolded with sudden and shocking speed. So shocked were the Japanese to see men on horseback just flooding into their midst that they broke, they ran. Ramsey scattered them, held the town long enough for the rest of the American Filipino troops to come up and be able to put up a fight there and slow the Japanese down. That was the last charge in American history. Ramsey, when I talked to him, he got all choked up talking about his horse, Glen Orange, and Felipe Fernandez, the same thing. And I'm just going to, um, for me, something Felipe told me just resonates more than anything else and what's at the absolute heart of this story, and that is the relationship, again, between these men and their horses, the hardships that they endured together, the fact that when they were starving, the troopers would share their rations with the horses, even though they didn't have enough for themselves. Just the bond between these men and their horses was something else. And I just want to read one excerpt here from, um, from the end, and literally it was the end of the cavalry as we know it. And this is as told to me basically by Felipe Fernandez. In late January, well, January 18th, January 19th, 1942, MacArthur's troops were starving. Most of their food stores had been destroyed by the Japanese. They were on half rations, basically living on a little rice and raw fish every day. They were getting less than 1,000 calories a day. The horses, there was very little left for them, very little oats, very little hay, very little anything. So they were starting to waste away, both from the strains of the campaign and also the fact they simply didn't have enough to eat. Wainwright, the ex-cavalryman and peer, the current cavalryman, commander of the 26th, had to make a decision that absolutely ripped at them. They knew that the horses couldn't go on for much longer. They knew that their men were starving, and there was only one decision they could make. So this is kind of the last stand of the 26th Cavalry here. And as told to me by Ed Ramsey and Felipe Fernandez. <coughs> General Wainwright drafted the order on January 21st that the 26 horses were to be ridden south that evening to a large pasture near Agua Loma Point along the South China Sea and turned over to the quartermaster corps. The drop-off point offered the horses the best chance for forage in the region. Still, unless food supplies miraculously arrived from some quarter for Wainwright's army, those valiant horses who with their riders had come through so much combat and so many hair-raising marches nearly round the clock from December 21, 1941 to January 17, 1942, would have to be killed, 
tortured, and eaten. Wainwright and Pierce were determined that they themselves would starve before taking one bite, in Mrs. Wainwright's words, of their friend. While Pierce took a drag on a cigarette, Wainwright, with a somber smile, informed him that the War Department had just approved MacArthur's and Wainwright's recommendation that Pierce be promoted to Brigadier General. Later, Pierce would write that he would have preferred to remain a colonel at the head of his cavalry column. With the horse's grim fate decided, the 26th New Status, as a dismounted unit, hit full force on January 22nd, when reports arrived that the Japanese had cut through the jungle and were spilling behind MacArthur's First and Second Corps north of Bagat, which is one of the Filipino villages. Pierce was prompted to send his motorized unit to spearhead a counterattack along the breach. The cavalrymen sensed that something was up when they were told to stay in their camp with their horses and not to ride out to the action. <coughs> the order to take the horses to Agualoma Bay was issued at dawn at the same time that the rest of the 26th was rolling out of camp and up the road to take on the Japanese. Corporal Felipe Fernandez battled his emotions the entire day and took care of Mike, his horse, every spare moment I had. All right, I am going to just show you. That's Felipe right there in the action, manning a machine gun. That's Felipe and Mike. This is a photo that Felipe had carried with him throughout the war on the death march in the camp and found about two years ago when he was going through some things in his attic. Not looking for that in particular. It just fell out of a trunk in the attic. And he told me when he found it, he sat up there in his attic, he said, and he sobbed. He goes, for a long time, he was just absolutely overcome with memories of his horse, Mike. Um, so, um, all right. At dusk, the order to move out peeled across the bivouac. The riders gently placed the worn saddles on the fatigued horses bowed backs and tied up their cinches. Lifting the horse's hooves, Felipe and his comrades removed pebbles lodged in their worn iron shoes. Fernandez nestled his right boot into the stirrup dangling on his saddle and nodded as Mike's head came up and his posture turned ramrod straight as Fernandez had trained him to do so long ago, so many years before the war. At the non shouts to form double columns, Mike cantered into place with a spring remarkable for a horse so underfed. Pangs of pride and sorrow flowed through Felipe Fernandez. Similar pangs tore at Ed Ramsey in his hospital cot. His horse, Bryn Oren, stood somewhere in Troop EMF column, and another rider sat astride the steed. It would not be the young officer, Ramsey, who had swept across the polo field on his magnificent charger and had shared every hardship from Fort Stotzenberg to the end of the war with him. Bear with me here. I messed up the order of the pages. Okay. Um, Ramsey's teammate on the 26 Polo Squad, Arthur Whitehead, wondered how his horse, Crow Flight, was faring. Still far behind enemy lines and desperately working his way south in hopes of rejoining the regiment, Whitehead had last seen Crow Flight in the chaos of the stampede on Christmas Day. He had no idea whether his feisty, nimble sorrel mare was still alive. Corporal Menandro Perrazzo had already mourned for his mount, Diablo, and was glad that he was now with the scout cars in the middle of the battle as the rest of the 26 headed to the Oceanside Pasture. He preferred that deadly action to watching the rest of the horses on their last march. Troop e and F slipped onto the coastal road to Agualoma Bay, moving in near total jungle darkness. Fernandez could barely look at Mike's head bobbing in measure with each step. All through the long winding march, Fernandez's thoughts drifted back and forth, his reverie starting with the day when Lieutenant Russell Bowers had seen how a corporal was whipping a high-spirited horse with wild brown eyes and a thick mane in a vain attempt to break him. Bowers had torn the lariat from the corporal's hands, taken the Mustang away from him, and given him to Fernandez. Now Russell Bowers was dead, last seen blasting away at Japanese tanks to save Felipe Fernandez and the rest of his men. As the two columns filed closer to the coast, strong salt air wafting around them, Mike snorted with pleasure. He had always loved when Fernandez had taken him on training rides along the beaches. 
Fernandez wished that he could reach into his pocket and pull out a fistful of oats or a sugar cube from Mike as in the old days and feed him from his palm. One thing remained the same. Whenever Fernandez and his horse's name said his horse's name, Mike's ears would stand up and he would turn his head to nuzzle his rider. Mike whinnied as the scent of the sea grew stronger and Fernandez recalled how his horse had responded so calmly, so skillfully in our first encounter with the enemy and how Mike seemed to anticipate what was good for both of us from that first battle to our treading the treacherous trails when we were lost in the mountains. All too quickly for Fernandez, the jungle, end, jungle ended and opened onto the wide pasture above Agua Loma Bay. Moonlight slanted through dark clouds, illuminating the parked jeeps and trucks of the quartermaster corps. Officers and men leaned against the vehicles and waited for the riders to file onto the grassy expanse and dismount. His limbs numbed, tears at first trickling and then streaming down his face, Felipe Fernandez slid from his saddle, still clutching the pommel with both hands and pressed his head against Mike's shoulder. Mike seemed to know that it was the last day that we would be together, Fernandez later said. With one last firm but affectionate slap on the haunches from their companion, the horses galloped to the center of the pasture and instinctively gathered in a herd and waited. Many of the scouts were sobbing. Fernandez could not even lift his head to launch Mike into motion. The trooper did not need to. He let go of the saddle horn. He leaned against me, Felipe said, and wheeled around to face me, tossed his head high, and silently wheeled about to join the rest of the herd, as if saying that he was ready to give up all of himself to the cause. The scene would haunt Felipe for the rest of his life. It hurt me so much to let him go. It was an order, though, so I just had to bite my tongue to prevent the cuss words from pouring out, numb my mind as if it did not happen, and just keep the good memories Mike and I had together. I would never have such a friend as Mike ever again. The cavalrymen were marched over to the trucks, climbed into them, and were driven to the front, now as foot soldiers. Captain William Chandler struggled that night to describe the troopers' goodbyes to their mounts. All he could bear to write was a simple, heart-rending line. The quartermaster has confiscated them. For the horses gathered in the seaside clearing, the battle had ended. The last charge sounded. The U.S. Cavalry would never thunder into combat again, only into history's twilight. So um, that, for me, the nub of the story is Felipe and Mike, and um, they stand, in my mind, for everyone who served in that unit and stood so bravely. So if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to take them on at this point, and uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, they did. A uh, number of them did. As a matter of fact, a man who led the uh, last charge, he escaped from the uh, hospital he was in because he was just determined to fight on and wasn't going to be taken alive. He had quite, quite the interesting career fighting with the guerrillas in the Philippines for the rest of the war and then rejoined the army when MacArthur invaded in 1940, 1944. Felipe Fernandez uh, was eventually released from the POW camp he was in, same thing. He went into the mountains to fight with the guerrillas, Ferdinand Marcos and that crew, basically. Um, so a lot of them did. Um, several of the other officers did also, but most of them ended up in the last fight on Corregidor and in Bataan and were taken prisoner there. So a great many of them, um, especially the officers, um, ended up in the camps and on the Bataan Death March, all of that. You know, not originally. It's a good question. Not originally. I, um, you know, you knew there was going to be this, um, at the nub of it, the story of the men and their horses, but I didn't realize to what degree. And when Felipe would be start talking about Mike, it really was as if he was talking about a person, a friend, someone who was far more than a horse to him. And uh, he um, gets all choked up talking about it. And again, he said for years and years he would not talk about it his horse. He would not talk about Mike. And uh, so what they endured together, they endured everything together, not just Mike and Felipe, but all these guys. And there was a very special bond between them and their horses, which again, 
the era was passing. It wasn't going to be that anymore in the American Army or basically anywhere else. So they were the last of their breed, the last of their kind, and they knew it. And there's also a great deal of pride that Felipe and Ramsey and a lot of these guys, the survivors, they take in the fact that they were the last of their kind and they feel like they wrote a really bold and fitting epitaph to the cavalry, history of the cavalry in America, in American history. So, good question. Yes? That's a really good question. Actually, most of the horses were transported. The horses for the cavalry were um, raised on ranches in Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas. So, for instance, Felipe's horse, when he was first, um, when he was first brought over, his, he, before he named him Mike, he just had like, he was called OK, and there was a number after it, reflecting that he had been shipped over, transported from one of the uh, ranches in Oklahoma. They put them on ships. They put them on, transported them on ships, yeah. Same as the way most of the guys came over there too, yeah. But uh, almost all of the horses came um, from the States because, and you can see in that picture, Felipe's not a small man. You can see how large Mike was. In the traditional cavalry horse, you wanted a large mount because if you're going, even crowd control, if you're going into a crowd, you want a horse that simply by its bulk is going to move people. So, but that's a great question. Yeah, most of the horses did come from the States. Okay, um, there's no more questions. I believe um, there's um, books out in the lot. Yes, in there? Oh, I thought, sorry. Um, I'd be more than happy to sign. Yes, Nina. Yes. <laughs> okay. They, well, in the Philippines, where there, there were a lot of roads that weren't that bad, and there was jungle alongside, and the bicycles actually could move along the trails better than vehicles could. And they could do in the same way what the 26, the mounted troops would do with, if aircraft came overhead or they ran into something they didn't like, they could just get off the road on their bikes, you know, really easily kind of thing. But basically, um, because the bicycles could literally get some places where you couldn't get tanks along the trails. And this way, they were able to uh, try to scout, get behind American lines and just see what was going on behind there. They could do it in a way that the Japanese didn't have horses on their dock. So um, in a sense, the bicycles, the bicycle scouts were their version of the mounted troopers of the 26. But the bikes kind of turned out to be um, pretty useful, pretty useful on the terrain that they fought in. Yeah. Patch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The um, basically that right there is obviously not a horse. It was a cavalry um, from some of the going back to the uh, days of the old west. What they would do a lot of the shoulder pads that they would have would be a mythological creature with a sword or with a trident, even something like that. You think it would be nautical, but. Um, this right here, according to Felipe, I'm not sure I see it, but he thought that it's a horse. He's looking at the head and thought it was a horse. To me, it looks like some creature from Greek mythology or something. But uh, So I can't actually answer exactly what that is, other than it looks to me a mythological creature with a sword. Not fighting on horseback. There were still some units who were designated as cavalry. We still have them, like, you know, the um, first air cav and that kind of thing. And they become mainly paratroopers. But the principle being the same, scouts and reconnaissance, that kind of thing too. But we don't have um, any, we didn't have any other bona fide cavalry units in World War II. The 26th was absolutely the last of its kind. They began the war with roughly 750 men, about 30 officers, and the rest enlisted men. By war's end, about 210 made it. Yeah, so all the horses. And uh, there were a number, not all of them were killed in combat. I mean, some of them died on the uh, death march in Bataan, and others died in the camps. But for the 26th, 
because they were so much in the thick of it the whole time the actual campaign was going on, most of their deaths came actually in combat or riding back and forth from the front. Pretty much wraps it up, and again, um, I appreciate your taking the time to come here, and really appreciate your taking the time to listen. So, thank you. <laughs>